Let me just say a word. Every now and then I like to say a word of uh, thanksgiving and gratitude to different people. Uh, first of all, let me just echo what Pastor Austin said earlier. For all of you that came out yesterday, I don't know how many we had, 40 to 60, somewhere in that range. We had a lot of people here. Thank you so much. We didn't just work two or three hours. We worked from nine to six, amen? And we worked hard, and you worked hard, and I want to just say thank you so much for having a servant attitude and coming out and, and doing what you did. And then also I want to just give it up for one of our serve teams today. I'm standing on this platform. Each one of these pieces weigh I don't know how much, 150, 200 pounds, each one of these pieces. We got guys and gals that come in every single Sunday at 6 o'clock a.m., and for an hour, takes them about an hour, they set this stage up. And uh, it was a little hard this morning because we lost an hour of sleep. Would you just help me and give it up for this team, our setup team? Amen. Come on. We are so, so, so thankful, so thankful for them. And we're glad to have you here today. And if you're a first-time guest, I'm Pastor Ronnie Coleman, and I'm the pastor here, the lead pastor. And uh, we started this church almost four years ago. Guys, we'll be celebrating our fourth birthday uh, two weeks after Easter, I think it is. And so uh, we're really excited about what God is doing, what God has done. But we're excited about what God's going to do this day because I believe that God has a word, a word for me and for you. So uh, let's look together at this subject, overcoming temptation. Overcoming temptation. Let me ask you a question before we ever begin the introduction of this message. How many of you have been tempted? Come on, every hand ought to go up. All right, put your hands down. How many of you were tempted this morning on your way to church? All right, a few of you were. How many of you have ever given in to temptation? Every hand ought to go up. Because we battle with that, don't we? All the time. Temptation. We all deal with it. Sometimes we want to blame temptation on the day in which we live. You know, well, wait a minute. Pastor, don't you know we live in the worst time in the history of America? I mean, we live in a sinful society. And, uh, and that's the reason we give in to temptation maybe more than they did in the 1950s or 40s or 30s or whatever. No, 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 no. Think about this. Adam and Eve lived in paradise. And they still had to deal with temptation. Is there a way to deal with it? Is there a way that we can overcome temptation? Do we have to give in to it? Do we have to fall in sin? We don't have to. We can learn how to overcome it. Let me ask you another question. Can we live without temptation? No. We're all going to be tempted on a daily basis. But we can learn to live in such a way that we do not have to yield to it. I think really some people think that you have to yield with it. You, you just can't win. You, there's no way possible that you can get through this temptation and make it to the other side. But I've got news for you. You can. Two quick things. If you're unsaved today, if you've never given your heart and life to Jesus, let me just say you're on your own. You have no defense. If you're a Christ follower, you can understand what it's about, who's behind it, and you can live without continuing to give in and fall. Now I want to read to you Mark chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. It's on the screen. Mark 1, verses 12 and 13. Let me just say at the outset that we're going to walk through the book of Mark. But when we walk through the book of Mark, whatever the subject matter is, as we lead up to Easter, in this series, the Jesus series, we may veer off from Mark and go to another gospel because it may be that another gospel gives us more detailed information about the subject. We're going to do that today, but I want, to, I want to let Mark 1, 12, and 13 kind of be the platform that we jump off of. Now, the Bible says in Mark chapter 1, verse 12, at once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness. I think that's interesting that he was led into the wilderness, into temptation, into trial by the Spirit of God. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, and being tempted by Satan, he was with the wild animals, and the angels attended to him. Now look, if you will, in Matthew, because we get the full text here, Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11. Look what it says. 
Matthew chapter 4, you got that? Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11. You don't have that. All right, let me look at it here. I want you to, I want you to see this. So go ahead, if you haven't already, Matthew chapter, there it is, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Then Jesus was, once again, led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Verse 2. You don't have it. All right, let me go back here. Everybody look at it. I want everybody to see this. Matthew 4, Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led by, by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting, Anybody know what fasting is? Another sermon will come later if you've never heard of fasting. Now, fasting is not what you do when you're getting ready to go. Now, it is this, but it's not a spiritual fast. When you're getting ready to have a surgery or you got to go give blood, you can't eat supper the night before. No, no, no. We're talking about a spiritual fast. And Jesus was fasting. The Bible says after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter, who's the tempter? Come on, talk to me. Who's the tempter? All right, now watch this. The tempter came to him and said, If you're the Son of God, tell the stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you're the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands. And now the devil's quoting scripture here, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered and said, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Verse 8. Again, the devil took him to the very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And all this I will give you. And he said, if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written. Did you notice every time that he tempted him, he came back with, it is written. Say it with me. It is written. Come on, say it again. It is written. Guys, here's the deal. The word of God is powerful. It's powerful. If you go to our website and you look at our core values of our church, one of our core values is conservative. I had one person come to me on one occasion. Well, I, I just don't think I can attend a church or, or go to a church. I just don't think a conservative church is going to reach very many people in the day in which we live. Well, in their mind, they were thinking conservative politically. One of our core values is progressive. Don't think that means uh, being liberal either. But she was thinking, this person was thinking that conservative, well, conservative means we believe the word of God, every single word of it. Why? Because Jesus did. Jesus said, it is written. It is written. The last verse he said, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And the, then the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. Listen, when you quote the word of God at the enemy, he's got to run. He's got to flee. We're going to talk more about that in a moment. The word of God. So here we have in this passage of scripture, I think a formula how you and I can overcome temptation in our lives. Now what's a definition of temptation? Let me give it to you. You might want to jot this down. A definition of temptation is simply this. Temptation is an enticement to get a person to act contrary to God's word and God's will. Let me repeat that. Temptation is simply an enticement to get someone, a person, to act contrary to God's word and God's will. Why? Because obedience to God is paramount. God wants his children to be obedient to him. Therefore, now watch this, the other side of the coin is disobedience is the end game for the enemy. There's nothing that would make the devil happier in my life and in your life than for you and I to be disobedient to God's word and God's will for our lives. So how are we going to overcome temptation? Well, what I want to do today is I want to give you six questions. And then we're going to answer those questions according to the word of God. Question number one, jot these things down. Question number one, when does temptation come? When does temptation 
come. Well, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1, then Jesus was led, that's so important, circle that word if you write in your Bible, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Jesus was led. So when does temptation come in our lives? Well, oftentimes it comes when we're weak. Jesus, the Bible said, had just been praying, talking to God day and night, fasting, hasn't eaten anything in 40 days, and he's physically, emotionally, mentally drained. I don't know if you've ever fasted very long or not. I, the longest fast I ever did was a seven-day fast, and I want to tell you, after seven days, you're tired, you're weak, you're hungry. Could you imagine a 40 day fast. The Bible says that Jesus was weak and he was tired. Why? Because he had been fasting. Oftentimes the devil attacks you when we are weak. He knows he knows that we're hungry. He knows that we're tired and he comes after you when you're listen, when you and I are weak, we are a sitting duck for the enemy. I know you've heard me say this before. And I, I and I want to uh, I want to uh, take my own advice. I need to take my own advice. But sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is take a break, rest, take a nap, take a vacation. Well, I ain't got no money. Well, take a vacation at home, rest. When we are spiritually, mentally, physically exhausted, we are a sitting duck for the enemy. He comes at us when we are weak, but also, now watch this, not only when we're weak, but also after times of blessing. After times of blessing. After mountaintop experiences. Well, what do you mean? Well, I don't know if you notice this, but in chapter 4, verse 1, it starts off the sentence with the word then. Why? Because he wants you to know there was something before that happened before uh, what's taking place right now. What happened before? Jesus had a mountaintop experience. He was just baptized by his cousin, John the Baptist. He was entering into his public ministry, and about that time, watch this, about that time, God the Father spoke in an audible voice and he said so everybody could hear this is my son in whom I'm well pleased I mean this was a mountain top experience in Matthew chapter 3 so sometimes the devil attacks right after a mountain top experience have you ever experienced that before in your life of course you have maybe it was that Sunday you got saved Maybe it was something that happened in you. Maybe it was last Sunday. Maybe it was when you got saved way back. But God, God, sometimes the devil attacks after a mountaintop experience. Now, guys, listen. After the dove, the Bible tells us the dove came and landed on Jesus. After the dove comes the devil. After the dove comes the devil. After the blessing comes the temptation. So, number one, he attacks us when we're weak. Number two, he attacks us after a blessing or a mountaintop experience. But also now, this is one that you may, not, you may not have thought of. He also attacks when we think we're strong. Now, now follow this. When we think we're strong, in other words, this can make us very vulnerable. Now, young Christians get it. If you've been saved maybe a week, two weeks, a year, you get this because you know that without Jesus, you're, I mean, you're just physically, you're spiritually weak and you're young and you're being nurtured and you're trying to grow in your faith and you get this. But somebody that maybe has been saved for five years or 10 or 20 or 30 years, now watch this, this is what happens to you. Sometimes you may say, well, I'd never do that. Oh, I'd never give in to that temptation like that person did. Can I remind you, the Bible says, pride comes before the fall. I mean, look at Peter. Peter said to Jesus, hey, Jesus, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'm going to be by, by you to the very end. Wherever you go, Jesus, I'm going to go with you. I'll never. Now, they may leave you. 
John may leave you. Those guys, they may leave you. They may turn their back on you. But God, I'll never leave you, Jesus. Guess what happened? He denied he even knew who Jesus was. So when we, are, we, we think we're strong, sometimes we become very vulnerable. But also, but also the devil comes and tempts us before a big endeavor or before a big event. For example, Jesus was getting ready to enter his public ministry and lives are going to be changed forever and ever and ever and ever. Now guys, listen to me. As a church, let me speak from the, um, the umbrella of the church. In three weeks, three weeks from today, we're going to be celebrating Easter in this building. Now, we believe that the bottom section will not only be filled up, but we're going to have tons of people up in the upper deck there. And people are going to come to church on that day that normally don't come to church any other time. Why? Because you're going to invite them. By the way, you don't have to wait till Easter to invite. Amen? Invite now. But we're going to have tons and tons of people that are here that are going to hear the gospel, and we're praying that God saves 100 people. Now, I want to tell you something. That's going to be a big endeavor. That's going to be a big event. And many people, potentially, their life is going to be changed by Jesus. Do you think that makes the devil happy? No, he's going to come against this church with everything he's got. He's going to tempt us. He's going to try us. And we're going to go through some stuff the next three weeks. I'm just telling you guys, the devil is so stinking predictable. So when you're getting ready to go into a big event or a big endeavor, just expect Jesus was about to enter his public ministry and change the world. And Satan was trying to derail him. He'll do the same thing to you. He'll do the same thing to you. He wants to derail you. We've got to get this thing out of our minds that we think that, man, if I'm living for Jesus, everything's going to be a cakewalk. Where did you get that from? It's tough, amen? Real quick, I, gotta, I, I spent way too much time. Number two, question number two. Where does temptation come from? Chapter 4 of Matthew, verse 3. Where does temptation come from? The Bible says, then the tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell the stones to become bread. If the tempter came to him, who's the tempter? The tempter is Satan. Where does temptation come from? Number one, Satan. Folks, he's real. Wait a minute, wait a minute, I thought I was coming to one of these young, cool, uh, you know, loud music, shiny lights, lights down, lights up. I mean, I, I thought I was coming to one of these new hipster kind of churches. You don't believe in the devil, do you? We absolutely do. If there is a God, there is a devil. If there is a heaven, there's a hell. Whoa, you don't believe in hell, do you? We sure do because Jesus believed in hell and Jesus preached on it more than he did heaven. The devil is alive and well and what he wants to do with your life and my life and this church is to derail it and to cause havoc in it. That's what the devil is about. He is real. He's intelligent. He knows your weak spots. He's completely evil. He's the father of lies. He's a fallen angel. Now, guys, don't get, don't misunderstand. It's not like God is here and the devil is here. Oh, I know it's kind of like dualism. I mean, it's they both have the same power. Absolutely not. God created Lucifer. Lucifer sinned against God, became proud, and he was cast out of heaven. The devil has on, the only authority he has is the authority that God gives him. He wants to destroy us. He wants to derail us. So where, do, where does temptation come from? Yes, it comes from the devil, but, but listen, don't, it doesn't only come from the devil. It comes from you and I. We want to blame everything on the devil. Well, the devil made me do it. No, he didn't. I want to ask you to look with me in James chapter 1 and verse 14, James 1, 14 down through verse 16, the Bible says, but each person is tempted 
watch this, when they are dragged away by their, oh my goodness, their own evil desire and enticed. The Bible says that our hearts, our hearts are desperately wicked. That's what the Bible says. Then after desire has conceived, it it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Sometimes, listen, we want to blame everything on the devil. And I'm here to tell you, and I'm here to tell myself, that sometimes it's not the devil. Sometimes it's you and I. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13, the Bible says that God gives us a way out. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. Say it with me. God is faithful. Come on, say it with me. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. He provides a way out. Temptation comes to all. The young, the old, men, women, new Christians, mature Christians. Question number three. Question number three is, who does temptation come to? Who does it come to? Well, in a very broad sense, it comes to everybody. But in a specific sense, I want you to write these things down. In a specific sense, I think that out of my 20 plus years, 25, 26 plus years of full-time ministry, I really believe that the devil, now watch this, I believe that the devil attacks more than anybody else, new believers, new believers, and those who are a threat to him. Well, let's think about it. Let's just, let's talk about new believers for a minute. New believers. Do you remember when you first got saved? I mean, everything, you were on cloud nine, man. I mean, you were so pumped. You were so excited about I mean, you just couldn't believe the peace that you felt, the joy that you felt on the inside. And you were, man, you were so super pumped about living for God. And then all of a sudden, here comes the devil. Nobody in here but me, right? Y'all remember that? Man, the devil knows if he can attack a new believer and derail them, he's done his job. At first, man, you're excited, and then here comes the enemy. He tries to discourage new Christians. That's why it's so important for us to pray for and nurture new believers in Christ. Those of you that have been saved recently, those of you who've been saved in the last Two or three years. Those of you that will be saved today, you're going to be encouraged immediately to join a dinner party and to get plugged into a serve team. And and, and I think it's necessary. We need to get plugged in. Why? Because as a new believer, we need other Christians around us to encourage us and help us through those difficult times that the devil brings us. So, who, who does temptation come to? Number one, new believers. Number two, those who are a threat to him. <laughs> Vance Havner, that great preacher, said, if you haven't been through the devil's sifter, you're probably not worth sifting. Hello? Now listen, if you feel like you're being tempted on a constant basis, some of you nodding your head like right now. You're like, if some of you, says, you feel like you're being tempted on con- constantly, can I just say that's not a bad thing? What that means is that you're on the right track. Because if you're giving your life to Jesus and serving God with everything that's within you, I mean, you are looking forward to what God has in store for you today and tomorrow, and you're pumped about living for Christ. Guys, listen. That don't make the devil happy. You're a threat to him. But if you're not tempted at all, that means he's not worried about you. He's not concerned about you. Question number four. How does temptation come to us? 
If you don't get anything else I say today, get this. How does temptation come to us? In most cases, Satan uses the mind. The mind. Listen to what the Word of God says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3. The Bible says, but I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds, say your minds. Come on, wake up. Say your minds. Your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4, look what he says. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Where do strongholds develop? They develop in the mind. When Satan tempts us, he primarily tempts us in the mind. Our problem is that oftentimes we want to flirt with sin. We know we ought not do this, or we know we ought not do that, or this or that, and we want to just kind of flirt. We want a window shop. How many of you ladies tell you, I'm just going to window shop? Tammy tells me all the time, she lies. I heard about this one lady, she said to her husband, I'm go, I, I want to go, I'm just going to go window shop. She, and he was a tightwad man. He was Mr. Conservative. I mean, he was just, you know, he squeaked when he walked, brother. I mean, he said, now, now, honey, we, we don't have the extra money to spend. Now, don't buy another. Oh, I'm not. I'm just going to window shop. Now, honey, now, don't you look at me. Look, she's trying to look. I, please, we don't have no money. Don't spend nothing. I'm not. I'm just going to go window shop. She went window shopping. She saw a dress. Before long, she went in and tried the dress on. She walked out of the dresser room, went to the cashier, and bought the dress. They bagged the dress up. She got home with the dress, and her husband said, whoa, 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 whoa. what's this? Uh, it's a dress. I saw it. I just couldn't, I just couldn't resist. But honey, I told you that we, we didn't have the money to buy a dress or buy anything. You said you were going to window shop. She said, the devil made me do it. So what do you mean the devil made you? He appeared in the dressing room. And he said, you look good in that dress. He said, well, you should have told him at that very moment, get thee behind me, Satan. She said, I did. Then he said, looks good from the back too. Sometimes we want a window shop. There's some things that we know we need to stay away from. And you say, man, I'm going to come. I, I, I'm going to look. I'm not going to touch. I'm not going to buy. I'm just going to flirt a little bit. Guys, listen, if it's something that you don't need to be around, don't do that. How does temptation come to us? It comes to our minds. Number five, where is the best place to be when temptation comes? Are you ready for this? In the will of God. Matthew chapter 4. It's on the screen. Matthew 4 and verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Where was Jesus when the temptation came? He was in the very will of God. You know, oftentimes we bring temptation on ourselves because we are outside of the will of God. We bring it on ourselves unnecessarily. Why? How? We hang out with the wrong people. We go to the wrong places. And we end up doing the wrong thing. Peter's another good example of that. When Jesus was in going through trial after trial and being cross-examined. Peter decided not to go with Jesus and be by his side. Friend, I want to tell you, the best place to be is by his side. And Peter did not follow Jesus. He, he, he stopped short and he began to warm his hands around the enemy's fire. 
One came. Hey, you're Peter. You're, you're a disciple of Jesus. No, I'm not, Noah. Another person came. Hey, you're Peter. You're Peter. You're a disciple of Jesus. Noah, no, I'm not. Listen, when he got himself in a predicament, he should have got up and left, but he didn't leave. He stayed there. Another one came. You're a disciple of Jesus. No, I'm not. And he cursed that he even knew God. Listen, he, he, he let himself get in a position, the wrong place, the wrong people, and the wrong thing happened in his life. He was outside of the will of God. The last question I want to ask you is this. What is the primary weapon we use when temptation comes? What's the primary weapon we use? I want you to go with me to Ephesians chapter 6, because I want you to see this, verses 14 down through verse 17, the primary, the primary weapon we use is the Word of God. Ephesians 14, or 6, 14 says this, stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with the feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which is that to, you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation. Now watch this. Those weapons up to that point, those weapons were all defensive weapons. There was only one offensive weapon. That he lists. Here it is. Are you ready? Take the helmet of salvation and the sword and the sword of the spirit. And the sword of the spirit. And the sword of the spirit, which is what? Say it out loud. The word of God. The word of God. What's our weapon? This is our weapon. This is our weapon. When the tempter comes, the word of God is our weapon. Psalm 119 and verse 9 says this. How can a young person stay on the path of purity by living according to the Word of God? Psalm 119 verse 11 says, I have hidden the Word of God in my heart that I might not sin against you. Here's the problem. We've got people who call themselves Christians in America today in our churches that don't know the Word of God. Guys, we need to memorize and study and meditate upon the Word of God. It's our power. It's our weapon. It's a sword. It's the offensive weapon. When the devil comes against us with everything he's got, with trials and temptations, man, we can take the Word of God and tell him to get lost. But we got to know the Word. We got to know the word. We need to memorize the word. When I was 16 years of age, I gave my life to Jesus. One of the things that my youth pastor did, his name was Bobby Mullins. He's been a mentor of mine. He's a great man of God. And one of the very first things he did was he instructed us and he helped us to memorize scripture. The, mem the scriptures that are in my mind now, I, I can't tell you how many just rolling around in there. Most of them came from an early age when I was memorizing scripture left and right. Well, I can't memorize anymore. Really? Well, you know, I just can't hardly memorize anymore. Sure you can. If I were to say to you, let's start singing the lyrics to the Beverly Hillbillies. I guarantee you, some of you, those lyrics, can you believe it? From 40 years ago or however long it's been, I guarantee you some of you got those lyrics in your head. Who, who knows that? Who knows it? All the old people. <laughs> Amen. If I were to mention to you, the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. I mean, you know those lyrics. Yeah, look at that. Y'all know these lyrics. They're in your head. We don't have a problem memorizing. We memorize what we want to memorize. We learn what we want to learn. Guys, we've got to put priority upon the Word of God and memorizing the Word. When temptation comes our way. We got to pull out scripture. That's what Jesus did. Matthew four, verse seven, verse uh, verse four, verse seven, verse ten. 
It is written. Hey, Satan, it is written. Hey, Satan, it is written. Hey, Satan, it is written. Flee from me. He said, I, and he fled, and he said, I'll come back at a more opportune time. Just because he flees doesn't mean he'll stay gone. You got to be ready at all times. You got to know the word. I, I challenge you. Man, if you have to, go old school. Pull the old three by five. They even make three by five cards anymore. I don't know. Just use your phone. I'm going, I'm going way back, aren't I? Write a scripture on it. I remember when I was 16, Bobby Mullen said, hey, write those scriptures on the three by five. Put them on the mirror in your bathroom. Put them in your locker. Memorize one verse a week. Get in the word of God. Jesus did it when Satan, listen, when Satan comes your way and he's going to, and he's going to try to tempt you and he's going to try you. When Satan comes and condemns you, you quote Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation in those that are saved. When Satan comes against you and he says, I, you're going to live in fear the rest of your life, you need to come back to him in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7 and say, God has not given me the spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind, and he'll flee from you. When the devil comes in and tempts you and he says, hey, hey, you'll never make it. You might as well just give up. You might as well just quit. Life is happening. And man, all these things are happening. Just give up. And you're tempted to give up. You need to quote Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When the devil comes against you and he tempts you to gossip, Ephesians 4, 29, let no corrupt talk come out of my mouth. Devil, I'm not going to do it. And he'll flee from you. When the devil comes against you and tempts you with a sexual sin, you quote 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexual immoral person sins against his own body. Devil! Flee from me. Guys, listen. It's no hocus pocus, but I'm telling you, there is power, 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 power in the Word of God. This is not just an ordinary book. It's living. It's breathing. It's infallible. It's inerrant. There's no errors in it. It is the word of the living God, child of God. Get to know it, memorize it, meditate upon it, learn it. If you don't, you're defenseless. If you don't, you're defenseless. When Satan tempts you, you quote the word of God at him, and you say, get behind me, Satan. We're so afraid of the devil. I mean, doesn't he have like a red suit on and a cape, long tail? I mean, isn't he mean? And I mean, I mean, he is a vicious. Let me tell you something. He is vicious and he's powerful, but he's not all powerful because the one that is all powerful is living inside of you, child of God. We gotta learn the word. We gotta learn the word. Child of God, let me say something to you for a second. A crucifix around your neck is not gonna do it. Nor is a silver bullet. That may help on what? A werewolf or what is that for? Vampire or something. No. It's not gonna work on the devil. Well, I know I'll wear some garlic around my neck. He, he don't like garlic. Well, nobody likes garlic. You won't have any friends. But that's not going to work either. Guys, listen, the only thing that's going to work is the Word of God. Memorize it. Meditate upon it. So that when the devil comes against you, he can spit it out of you. And he hates it. And he has to flee. But then last but not least, if you're here today and you
you're not a Christ follower, you don't have the power to resist anything. Wouldn't you like to have that power? You see, as a child of God, we have the power to resist. It's not our power, but it's the power of God living inside of us. But if you're here and you're not a child of God and you're not a Christ follower, that power doesn't reside inside of you. But hear, hear me, he can and he wants to live inside of you. He wants to save you. He wants to come and live inside of you. But you've got to be willing to say yes to him. Guys, we're all going to go through, in a very broad sense, we're all going to be tempted. The question is, does the Spirit of God live inside of you? If he doesn't, he wants to today.